Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and we will kick off momentarily. All right, welcome everyone uh, to Straight Talk for tonight's online community forum. My name is Rob Huff and I'm the Director of Communications and Advocacy for the Metropolitan Development Council. Tonight's conversation is the 49th in a series of discussions started last year. If you've listened to Straight Talk before, you'll recognize some changes tonight. Uh, for one, we took the month of July off and we are relaunching Straight Talk as a bi-weekly bi discussion now held on Wednesday nights uh, beginning at 5 p.m. each program. In addition, now I'm serving as the host for the show going forward. Previously, I'd just run the technology in the background. So I do want to take an opportunity to thank Amanda Westbrook, who had served as our facilitator for Straight Talk uh, over the last year plus. Um, if you're watching out there, Amanda, thank you so much. And uh, we'll miss having you on the show going forward. Um, we will continue to hold these discussions around important topics impacting our communities in Tacoma and Pierce County. And as always, the most important message throughout this series of dis discussions is that there is hope for our community. We would like to take a moment, and I will hit you. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this meeting is being conducted on the indigenous lands of the Puyallup people. We gratefully acknowledge that we rest on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people where they make their home and speak the Lachute Seed language. Throughout today's conversation, you can submit questions to be addressed by our speakers um, using the question and answer function in Zoom. We cannot promise that we will have time to consider every question, but we'll make our best effort to get through the list in our allotted time. And now I would like to introduce our guest for tonight's discussion, Haley Smith. Uh, welcome, Haley. Uh, Haley is the manager of outpatient services and withdrawal management at MDC. Um, Haley's been with us before, so welcome back to the program. Thank you, Rob. So, do you want to do a quick introduction, a reintroduction of yourself okay. for our Straight Talk audience? Sure, definitely. So um, as Rob said, I'm the program manager for MDC's withdrawal management, or also known as detox, and outpatient services. Um, so I have been with MDC since November of 2020, so a little bit less than a year. Um, and just a little bit about me, I did recently move back from South Carolina. So I was born and raised in Washington, moved back from South Carolina, and I was fortunate enough to be brought on to the MDC team. Um, my background is primarily in behavioral health with a heavy focus on substance use treatment and harm reduction specifically. So prior to relocating back to Washington, I managed the operations of multiple opiate treatment programs that provided medication assisted treatment in rural communities um, around the South. So that's my little, my little bio there. <laughs> Great. And what attracted you to, uh, to your work to begin working at MDC? Sure. Um, so I really, uh, in digging into just some of the other agencies around Tacoma and, and Seattle, because I was living across the country at that point in time, um, MDC had a lot of services that um, I was interested in continuing to provide. So um, I'm really grateful for the wraparound services. I think that's the best route to go when it comes to treatment. And well, I think we're getting into that in a little while with the co-occurring treatments, but MDC had a lot of programs uh, that were very beneficial to the community. So I thought it was a good, a good place to come to. Great, well, we're glad you're here, obviously. Thank you. So can you give us kind of an overview of the types of services that are offered through the center? Sure. So um, we offer a multitude of services. Um, outpatient services is the broad scope, uh, but within that umbrella, so primarily I think what the center is known for is substance use disorder services. So we provide um, assessments and placement assistance for inpatient treatment. So assessing people at various um, different ASAM levels. Um, we also offer outpatient treatment, intensive outpatient groups, 
Um, and so we do those for adults and for youth, although our youth program, um, which I'll touch on a little bit later, is uh, we're, we're working on revitalizing that program, but primarily we're seeing adults with substance use disorders. Um, with the co-occurring treatment services we also provide, so that's going to be talked about here in a little while, but we co-occurring treatment is for both mental health and substance use disorder diagnoses. And so we also serve individuals both within MDC and with a partnership through Catholic Community Services and Intivity House. We offer psychiatric medication management, uh, and we also offer supported employment services for individuals with both mental health and substance use disorder diagnoses. So what our supported employment specialists do is they assist with job placement services and they work um, with both clients and with local businesses to ensure good matches for jobs. Um, and then finally, we really try to offer warm handoffs and referrals to other programs and other types of services. The one that comes to mind the most is with medication assisted treatment providers. Um, and we can also facilitate admissions to our internal programs like our withdrawal management. Fantastic. So how, with all of those programs uh, and so many ways to, to make inroads to, to reach the center, how do potential clients most frequently interface with the, with the services at the center? Yeah, so that, that's obviously changed over the course of the last year. Um, but right now, uh, the best way to, to reach services or to obtain services would be just to, just to pick up the phone and call. So, and I can offer that phone number here in a little while, um, but calling the center with our main line to discuss services we offer to schedule an appointment. But luckily we are able to offer walk-in services at this point in time. So this, the center did recently reopen to walk-in services. We are not conducting any groups at this point in time, um, obviously due to COVID restrictions but we are able to offer one-on-one -on -one assessments um, and just to talk to people about the services that we offer. Um, oh, good, thank you for putting that on there. <laughs> so our phone number is on that website. Um, our walk-ins though are between 8.30 and three, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and 11 and three Tuesdays. Um, but we can generally accommodate uh, people if they come in while we have staff, staff on site. Great, what has been, a because of the changes in how services have been delivered, what has been kind of the flow or the demand, especially now that you've reopened for walk-in services? Yeah, um, so we've seen a steady increase in walk-in services. Um, I know, and this was prior to me joining MDC, but I do know that walk-ins were, were very prevalent through the center. Um, over the course of the last two months or so, we've seen a steady increase once the word is getting out that we do have uh, walk-ins available. So I would say daily, we have we have multiple people who walk in for services. They might not all be seen that day, but they are, they are coming in. So I think that's fantastic in terms of accessibility and availability of, of receiving services. So before you were able to open for walk-in services, things were being delivered through telehealth. Um, so how did that work? I mean, did, did you find that it was a successful tool for some people? Um, you know, how did that all play out? Sure, yeah, I have, I have very strong opinions on telehealth. So I'll just, I'll start with that. Um, you know, telehealth has been a great resource um, throughout the pandemic and even really prior to the pandemic, you see with the uprising of, of some of those apps for telehealth counseling, um, and you're seeing that more and more in rural communities. So, you know, it's been a great resource for a lot of our outpatient services, and it does allow for really good accessibility to treatment. Um, those clients who have limited transportation means um, or can't make it to appointments due to childcare or work schedules or disabilities that make it uh, dangerous for them to, to come out in our COVID landscape. So it does allow for a greater flexibility. On the other hand, all of those things can also be uh, detrimental, right? So we have people who might not have phone access or internet access to be able to utilize telehealth. And when, when everything was shut down, it was, hard for a lot of people to receive services. Um, there were, of course, things put in place to assist with that, but 
there was a lot of individuals who would contact the center and might not be able to fill out the paperwork on, on a phone or a computer or even really have that connection with the counselor. Um, there's, I think research does show that rapport um, with a client and a counselor is, is about equal with telehealth um, versus in-person services, but it does, it, it does impact that therapeutic relationship some. Um, that's my own personal opinion, but so there are pros and cons to telehealth. Um, I think moving forward in this kind of unfamiliar landscape though, a good hybrid model would be the best. So for those individuals who, who do require telehealth services um, to be able to provide those and for the ones who do want to come in or who can't utilize telehealth to be able to have an avenue for them to come in for services. So the telehealth offerings during COVID, were they mostly for individuals or were you still, were you doing some sort of group sessions yeah. through telehealth as well? Yeah, um, I would say it's primarily groups. So, so we see um, most of our individual clients are already involved in groups and it's part of their requirement to actually see a counselor individually as well, but the majority were within groups. Got it. Yeah. And going forward, do you see that same kind of mix? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I, I hear from a lot of our counselors and, and some of our clients who come in that that the groups are so much easier um, to work out with their schedule. For example, if they're on telehealth, they can do it anywhere from any place um, in the middle of maybe a lunch break for work if they need to. Um, but yeah, I think I think a strong hybrid model is, is gonna be beneficial. So offering both in-person groups and uh, telehealth groups once we're able to reopen would be best. Great. So there've been a lot of changes that have taken place during COVID, not only how you deliver your services, but the needs of people <laughs> who typically would come in for counseling. So yeah. how, have you, how have you seen that shift and and where do you think that is going right now? Yeah. So I don't think it's any surprise or secret to all of us that that just as a whole, even not not even just our clients, as a whole, our society has there's been a lot more stress out there. There's been a lot of um, you know emotion and relation stress. There's financial instability, um, and specifically speaking of substance use, increased overdose rates, increased substance use rates, increased mental health concerns. So, you know, the need for outpatient treatment has has increased. Um, the accessibility and the availability might have decreased, though, and that's that's where we're trying to level the playing field. Um, you know, workforce availability um, and accessibility, like I was just talking about before with internet capabilities. Um, these are just some examples, but uh, the need has increased and I don't, I don't see that decreasing anytime soon. Um, I, you, every day you pull up a news article and there's, you know, something about overdose rates or, or depression rates or anxiety rates. And so the need is still there. It's just a matter of needing the individuals who need those services. Um, and being able to provide effective care for them within a safe manner. So speaking of trying to meet those needs and meet people, people where they're at, what, what ways have you tried to innovate to do that? I, I know you're doing uh, work with Pierce County District Court at the Resource Center. Yeah, so, so a general response to that is we're just really trying to get, get out there into the community again and say that we have these services uh, for, for people who need them. Uh, so one of our partnerships that you referenced um, is with the Pierce County District Court Resource Center and they reopened for in-person services, I wanna say in May. Um, and so we started our partnership there with them and essentially it is for both uh, justice involved and non-justice involved individuals. They have a clothing bank um, that seems to bring a lot of folks in. They just recently opened a food, a food pantry as well. Um, and we have staff who are there, um, whether it be our recovery coaches or our substance abuse counselors. Sometimes I go there uh, for a while. I was going once a week and just sitting, sitting up there. And when people walk in for services, um, maybe they're sent from across the street at the courthouse. They're sent over to say, hey, I need an assessment for substance use treatment. Uh, we can do those on site or we can hook them up with a resource in the area. So 
that has been uh, pretty phenomenal in being able to actually physically meet people where they're at when they walk in. Um, what we've also been doing is having, they'll get, if no, if we do not have a presence at the resource center, then um, the staff there will send them down to MDC or one of their other partners. They have, I wanna say 10 plus partners um, that work that work out of the resource center as well. So it's a one-stop shop is, is how they like to advertise it. But really for, for us, we just want to get out there into the community. Um, we have uh, two peer recovery coaches who go out and do outreach within the community and share, share what MDC can offer individuals, share where to find us. So that's been really helpful as well. Fantastic. So what are the days and hours that you're at the resource center? Yeah. So I believe the resource center itself is open Monday through Friday from I believe 8.30 to five. Um, our staff there, it's, we have somebody there Tuesday mornings. Um, so from 8.30 or nine to about 12 or one. Um, Wednesdays mornings, I'm usually there, but that's kind of hit or miss right now, to be honest. And then Thursday afternoons, we have our peer recovery coach. So we're looking to add some more um, hours and days there. But truly, the Resource Center is, is a great one-stop shop. If MDC is not present there, they will either contact us directly, whether it be me or our administrative assistants, or they'll, they'll just send people down to our walk-in hours. Great. So can you, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the co-occurring disorder treatment that MDC offers. Right. Um, it, the first question is just, what is that? and, mm -hmm. and um, what sets it apart. And then is, is that fairly unique mm -hmm. uh, in the community or has it become a standard practice? Yeah, so what is co-occurring disorder? So I'll, I'll start by just saying that, and I mentioned it above uh, when we talked earlier, but co-occurring treatment is just simply, or co-occurring disorders are simply an individual who has both mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and, I believe that the research does show about half of people who experience substance use disorder during their lifetimes will also have a co-occurring mental health disorder or vice versa. So it does affect um, a lot of individuals. And the, the reasons behind that are varied. So um, there's three kind of primary hypotheses about, about that. Um, the first is that there might be some common risk factors that can contribute to both. So like genetics um, or environmental stress. A second one is, is also referred to as kind of the self-medication hypothesis. So uh, mental health disorders can contribute to substance use um, or vice versa is the third. So substance use can contribute to the development of mental health disorders. So with um, co-occurring disorders, generally we're seeing both substance use and the most common ones would be like anxiety disorders, mood disorders, so depression and bipolar, ADHD, and some psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia, for example. Um, but co-occurring treatment is, is exactly what it, what it states. So it's also referred to as dual diagnosis treatment. So it's treatment specifically designed to address both the mental health and the substance use. Um, and you really need both of those components um, for effective treatment. So co-occurring uh, co-occurring treatment is not is not extremely unique. Um, I would say it has become a standard practice because of that large overlap. If we're talking approximately half and and I, I personally think that's even a lower number than what when reality, um, most people need to address both to really um, achieve recovery or to achieve what, what they term recovery. Now, in most situations though, would that, would both of those disciplines be tackled by the same person or would they be with a team? Yeah, so it, it really depends. Um, with, with the programs that we offer, um, we are taking a team approach. So we have substance use disorder professionals, so SUDPs, um, as well as mental health professionals. So whether it be mental health professionals, specifically MHPs or licensed social workers um, or licensed practical counselors, whichever, whoever can provide mental health counseling. And we address it as a team. So one individual working with the substance use portion, one with mental health, and then coming together and doing some case management. Um, there are duly credentialed individuals who can provide both services. And 
you know, it really just depends on the individual and the program as to which would be best, but it can be done both separately as a team or as a team. Yeah. Great. And then where is MDC providing these services? Yeah. So um, like the physical location or. <laughs> yeah. So, so I know at one point um, there was a partnership with Catholic Community Services and Nativity right. House. Mm -hmm. So we still have that partnership. Um, so that is specifically for Nativity House residents. So individuals who are experiencing difficulties with housing. Um, and we have two fantastic uh, individuals there, one who works as an SUDP and one who is an MHP. Um, and they again, take that team approach through Nativity House. Um, the through MDC Behavioral Health and Recovery, that program, which is the counterpart to the Nativity House program, those services are being offered on site. So on our, at our 721 Fawcett Avenue location on the second floor, so in the center. Great. Mm -hmm. So looking into your crystal ball, um, what do you see ahead for the center uh, the rest of this year and beyond? Do you have goals, plans, what do you see as changes coming? I do. You know, one of the really great things about MDC is that uh, we have, there's a lot of potential there to expand into various areas. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned earlier is really trying to build upon our youth services again. Um, so that would go for my vision, um, strictly speaking, my own vision is to build up our substance use treatment for youth again, as well as incorporating some mental health components. So that, that co-occurring program. Um, another piece that I would really like to incorporate is more of a uh, whole family approach. So talking about prevention, um, working with parenting through um, our local CPS agencies, DSHS, um, because a lot of these issues um, go along and, and really impact families. So uh, a lot of individuals who are involved within DSHS want or need assessments um, and need treatment. And so being able to provide a more uh, well-rounded service um, to those individuals. So uh, I mentioned prevention already though, that's a, that's a pretty key component. Usually within substance use, there's treatment and prevention. And right now we're only really providing the treatment component. Um, and really just starting to uh, re reorient ourselves within the community. So the first big step was, as we discussed, the Pierce County District Court Resource Center. Um, and that is that is growing pretty large. And so I really look forward to building that relationship and continuing to integrate our services within the court systems. Um, I know Pierce County is doing some really great things with uh, mental health courts uh, and with drug courts. So there's a lot of opportunities to assist um, as many people as we can. So during COVID, and so I know prior to COVID, there are uh, many of the clients who did come into the center were referred through or connected through the courts. Um, courts were largely shut down during COVID for a period of time. How did that impact the center? Yeah, uh, it impacted the center pretty greatly. So we we received a lot of our referrals through um, the Department of Corrections, and when everything did did shut down, and I believe, and I'm not as well versed on this as probably some of my some of my staff who have been doing this for a long time, but uh, they received a lot of referrals um, from from probation and parole, and from the district and local courts, and with the court system not really, and for lack of a better term, kind of holding people accountable for, for, their, for their charges at that point, things kind of all shut down. Um, that really decreased the amount of individuals that we saw coming through the center. Uh, that is increasing slightly again, but it's, I see us having a, quite a long road, which is again why why the partnership with the with the resource center is so vital, and with the um, the mental health courts and the drug courts, and and building those relationships again. Great. So diversifying how you're doing outreach is helping build back, essentially. Yes, definitely, definitely. So outreach on um, just the 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 client side as well um, as the the business and the operations side. Yeah. Great. So um, I thought we could close out 
tonight with um, if you if you had some kind of anecdotal stories that you could sh share, um, especially I know you and I had talked a couple of weeks ago about some of the success stories that had come out of the relationship with the district court yeah. uh, resource center. So if you'd be willing to share some of that. Sure. Um, so specifically with, and I could speak to the resource center first, um, you know, we've had, we've had several really great um, successes through there. So one individual that, that comes to mind was an individual who was in a domestic violence situation and was also experiencing homelessness. And we were, she met up with our peer recovery coach who got her uh, linked in with the housing network and she was able to escape that that domestic violence relationship and get into housing. So while that wasn't one of our traditional kind of outpatient services programs, our recovery coach did um, help facilitate that referral and she's, you know, being able to transition into more stable housing. Um, some of the biggest success stories that I see, um, and well, you know, recovery looks different for, for everybody. And it's not always just about recovery. It's about just improving one aspect of people's lives, depending on what, what they want to improve. But being able to offer these wraparound services. So we see a lot of clients who utilize multiple different services within both outpatient services and around MDC. Um, the one individual comes to mind who was um, within our evaluation and treatment center. So our, our uh, involuntary psychiatric unit when he was released, um, he was able to continue his medication management um, through our psychiatric provider, uh, was also able to get into outpatient services for substance use, and um, has recently started with our supported employment team. And so looking for, looking for jobs. And so that's four different programs that he's been able to access um, within you know, I would, I would like to say pretty easily, you know, being able to come into our services and have a one-stop shop similar to what we were discussing before. Um, and a lot of the examples I have follow that same, same path. So we share a lot of individuals um, with different programs. So I think being able to offer all of those things, and there's so many more that MDC can provide that I'm not as well versed on to even speak of. And so I think that's one of the best things about our programs. So in closing out today, um, is there anything about the services at the center who that you just think, what is it that really kind of sets that, that part of MDC's services apart and that you wish people knew more about in the community? Mm -hmm. um, so I just think we have a wealth of knowledge and experience within our team. So we have some, some of our team members who have been uh, providing services to individuals for 30 years. And so there is, there's a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of experience. Um, and so then we also have some fresh faces, mine included, who are coming in to, to try to uh, expand services as well. So, you know, it's, I, the takeaway message that I would like to say, just speaking on the fly, would be that we we are here and we have accessible services. So just walk in and start to talk to us and we can help with, with various things, whether that be within the center or within all of MDC. Fantastic. So, and I shared the link to the center's website. Um, uh, the phone number to, to call in and make an appointment is front and center on the site. And in fact, if you go to the MDC website, uh, at mdc-hope.org. The big image that says recovery on the front links directly to the center's webpage. So um, yeah. I encourage anybody who's interested, uh, please please take a look and see what's offered and reach out to Haley and her staff. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I don't think we have, I haven't seen any questions from the the audience, uh, but I do want to thank Haley for joining us and um, and I encourage people to come back. Uh, we again have changed the format of Straight Talk so that we shifted to Wednesdays, and uh, also we're doing it from five to six and maybe a little shorter sessions than we had had over the mm -hmm. last year, um, but giving each conversation the length that it that it needs to get the message out. So. 
thank you everybody enjoy your evening uh stay cool and uh we'll see you in two weeks